Hello, everybody in the audience and our friends on Facebook Live. Welcome to another edition of the Sci Cafe here at KAUST. Um, this particular edition of the Sci Cafe is in partnership uh, with the Spring Enrichment Program, uh, matching the theme City of the Future. Uh, this could be a very wide ranging discussion, so before we even get started, I want to I want to get some feedback from the audience on, on now that you've attended some of the spring enrichment events, I actually want to know from you, the audience, what elements do you think of? What do you think is coming in the city of the future? Because that'll help shape how we discuss things with this panel. Who wants to chime in first with what they think is an element of the city of the future? Self-driving <laughs> Self cars. Urban farming. What else? Internet of things. Internet of things. Very relevant to our discussion today. Keep going. I need a few more. Shape the discussion. Smart homes, smart cities. Okay. Cars. This term smart, smart cars. Anything else? Nothing about healthcare? Nothing about quality of life? Nothing about parks? Energy efficiency. The, the, the point of the, the awkward questioning here is that when we say city of the future, that is a very broad topic. That could be a lot of things, and, and we don't know what that's going to look like in 10 or 15 years when these cities finally arrive. What we tried to do today, and for the format of the Sci Cafe, is we've selected three faculty and I'll have them introduce themselves here in a minute. We've selected three faculty that can address research that's happening here at KAUST, research that we're doing um, that's related to the city of the future. Uh, and then from their experience, these faculty would love to riff with you and kind of uh, on the fly discuss some of the other elements like urban farming, um, maybe what they consider to be a part of the city of the future, things that are maybe a little bit outside of their comfort zone. It's always fun to see faculty a little bit outside of their comfort zone. So just to remind you the format, I'm going to ask a few questions. I'm going to set the stage, tell you um, by steering the discussion what these faculty do. And in about 10 minutes, I need you ready with questions. What do you want to know more about from their research? Uh, what questions do you have of the city of the future? So uh, I'll, I'll start by having each faculty member introduce themselves, say a little bit how they came to their field of expertise, and, and maybe briefly introduce how it relates to a city of the future. So, Hussam, you want to start? You. Yes, uh, thank you, John. Uh, my name is Hussam Al-Sharif. Uh, I am a professor in the Material Science and Engineering program here at KAUST. Uh, I joined the KAUST in 2008, actually. I'm, I'm one of the founding faculty. Uh, I came from the semiconductor industry. So, I, I have been working on semiconductor materials before I came here. And uh, I continued this journey here at KAUST. Uh, our lab continues to focus on semiconductor materials. And besides making them, we are always looking for applications. And, and if either we can do it ourselves or we collaborate with many of the excellent faculty here on campus working on some areas. And, and later, we're going to touch on some aspects of our research that I believe relate directly to the topic of the discussion today. Perfect. Yeah, so if you're going to put Hussam in a box, he's kind of our sensors guy, which if we're going to make smart cities, we have to have billions and billions of sensors. Uh, Daria, maybe you want to introduce how you connect to that? Yeah, sure. Hi, my name is Daria Brown. I joined KAUS last year, so I should start from my childhood then. I think <laughs> I don't have a lot of work experience, so <laughs> I just started as an assistant professor. And thanks for inviting today, John. Yeah, yeah. I hope my Twitter followers will increase after this thing <laughs> as well. But um, So my interests actually lie on um, smart materials that one of you mentioned. And uh, as also as I mentioned, we would like to make them more applicable and make them smarter. So when, uh, when we think like we, we want smart cities and cities of the futures, are we smart enough to make those materials? <laughs> uh, so in our research group here, we focus on energy conversion and harvesting uh, and um, in engineer materials actually, uh, let's say for the cities of the future, how we can use efficiency, um, energy much more efficiently and how we can convert them into different formats and uh, come up with devices that can actually deliver this. Very good. So Perfect. Yeah. So you can also put dairy into the materials and also the energy side of this equation. 
Uh, again, if we're going to have billions of sensors, they need to be able to take some sort of a decision, and that's where our last panelist comes in. Jeff? Uh, so my name is Jeff Sham. I'm with Electrical Engineering here at Cal. I've been here almost four years now after being at a, a couple of other uh, universities over the years. So my area is control systems, and what are control systems? Uh, uh, you can think that there's a situation where you'd like something to happen, but what you can do is you can measure what's happening, reason about what to do, and then take an action. Uh, those are control systems. It turns out we're surrounded, surrounded by control systems. Uh, in a car, uh, you know, you, you're probably familiar with cruise control, but there's many other control systems in a car, anti-lock braking, uh, traction control, uh, just, again, the, they have this feedback cycle of measuring, reasoning, and acting. Just standing up is also natural control systems that we have in our body. Moving around is a type of control system. Homeostasis in our body, controlling uh, uh, sugar blood levels. Uh, blood sugar levels is another type of control system. Uh, and I'll share with you the, the control uh, scientist, the control engineer's lament. <laughs> uh, is that, you know, although we're surrounded by control systems, nobody talks about them because they are an enabling technology. They make the gadget work. When you fly a drone, maybe, I don't know how many of you have tried to fly a drone. Actually, you're not flying the drone. You're guiding the control system that's flying the drone. Uh, you're not turning and setting the speeds of all the propellers yourself. You're saying up, and the control system realizes up. Uh, so it's working, and we don't talk about it. When do we talk about control systems is when there's a crash. And you can always go to online and say control system failure, control system crash. Even I have a picture on one of my talks of a, of a dashboard. And uh, this, the message on the automobile dashboard of BMW is control system failure. That might be the first time the driver saw the words control system. When it was working, they didn't see control system success. <laughs> and now, in addition to control systems, I work on something called game theory. And now I can save what's game theory for the remaining uh, for the rich relation to smart cities. Well, Sounds fun. <laughs> Maybe you can continue on and, 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 and go ahead and make the connection now, Jeff, but um, I, I want you to try and explain to the audience, you know, we, we, we picture one person making a decision, we picture two people making a decision, we know how hard it is to get three people to make a decision. Um, as you start to scale all of these control systems, um, how difficult is that from a technical standpoint to whether it's game theory or otherwise, to, to make a decision in a smart city? So what, uh, game theory is, is decision making when there are multiple decision makers. What got me into game theory was actually dealing with engineered systems. Uh, the current model, uh, well, you can fly a drone yourself. How would you fly 10 drones? Okay, you're certainly not going to uh, be a maestro with 10 controllers. So what you might do is uh, have some programmed, they call it semi-autonomy, to have the rest of the drones follow what you're doing as a leader. And so if you imagine uh, a scenario of a coach and players, uh, and say uh, on, on a basketball court. So a coach is not a, a puppeteer controlling each player, but rather the coach can yell out a play, and then the players have to realize that play uh, themselves. So you have many decision makers. What makes multiple decision making uh, uh, tricky is that not all decision makers even if they are on the same team, they don't all have the same information. Uh, we've, all been, uh, we've been in situations, for example, in team sports where you pass it to someone thinking they're going to run, but they don't run. You didn't do that because you're on opposite sides. A ball falls in between two players that they wanted to uh, in volleyball or in, uh, in baseball. Uh, they're on the same team. How can that happen? So when you have multiple decision makers, uh, weird things can happen. And now that's when, even if you're programming all of these systems as engineered systems, now, when it gets to a smart grid, we're going to have, people have talked about the sensors, and they talked about how many sensors are, it'll be pervasive, sensors all over the place. We can't have all of these sensors sending all of their measurements to one centralized uh, unit, and that centralized unit deciding what everything uh, is going to uh, do, how everything is going to, to react. And so it's hard enough when these are engineered devices, even if they're on the same team, trying to make uh, decisions that work for each other. And then with a smart, uh, smart city, let's remember, city has people. And some of the decision makers will be people, and it could be that one person's interest is not necessarily aligned with, uh, with yours. If I want to go to work, uh, but it's congested, I'm not going to stay home for your sake, so I don't crowd the road for you. We all have our own interests, and, and then this challenge becomes, how can you incentivize individuals appropriately to make decisions that are good for the uh, collective? Very good. All right, so uh, 
Daria, you also have a connection to the solar center here at Kaos. Maybe you can say a few words about how um, solar is going to play a key role in the city of the future. Yeah, sure. If you don't mind, I just want to add yeah, a of bit course. of what uh, Jeff says. It's very interesting for the city of future, this aspect. And um, when I was thinking about this topic, I was thinking, yes, the population grows and we're more and more people, cities and so on. So we try to make our lives easier and there will be some decision makers on that. But ha like, there are two approaches to this. Like one is the, the global energy sources and grids, like you mentioned, and how renewables can play a role and complement each other. But I think there is a factor of uh, individual energy sources as well. So at this point, like we can think of uh, materials um, that can generate electricity or energy from its own source. So I think uh, maybe you can decide as an individual in a city if you would like to create enough electricity for your watch or consumables or um, energy generating devices where we work actually a bit on the solar center. Uh, so my research lies on the autonomous or self-powered devices mm -hmm. that, um, that uses, for example, sun or endless resources uh, that can generate electricity from that or convert available, for example, heat from your own body that can power up such devices that would, be, uh, that would allow um, track on the data evaluation or the, the big data storage afterwards. Perfect. So in the, in the solar center, I think how it started was purely solar that fits to this region and Middle East, um, considering the, the problems, the grand challenges. But now I think the faculty interests also grow and change to um, how we can benefit from sun or more general light mm -hmm. um, for, for, this, for the future. Very good. So in that, in that respect, we also work with Hussam, actually, so yeah, you uh, may, I, I was may take say, the lead and then... Yeah, more Hussam, maybe you can, because in the census initiative, many of the things yeah, you're working on... Yeah, before I get into the census, I also I think it's a nice continuation of the discussion that I started with Jeff and Daria commented on. Essentially, uh, we have you know, a spectrum of powers. You have from micro power all the way to, to giga, uh, you know, watt, watt, micro watt to gigawatt of energy. So uh, the, the requirements are different and how you deliver that power is actually different. Uh, so solar, of course, is one of the most efficient energy sources after the, the gasoline engine. So it is, if you're thinking about power in a city or powering at a large scale, of course, you're going to have to deal with solar. But there's a lot of uh, kind of sensors I'm going to talk about in a minute. They don't require really that much. For example, a hearing aid, we usually do that calculation in our presentations. It's a, it's a 100 microwatt type of device. Solar is really not the only way to do it. And there's a reason why you don't want to do it by solar. Because, for example, solar may not be present all the time. You know, the sun is not shining at, at night, for example. So if you need hearing aid, you don't want to stop listening or hearing at night. You know? So there is different, uh, uh, basically, sources of energy each more suitable and adaptable to the specific application that you have. But going back to the theme of sensors, uh, certainly when I was thinking about uh, how my research relates to, to the future, actually, uh, it, it turns out actually a sensor will, in my opinion, play uh, one of the largest roles uh, in, in the development and evolution of future cities. And if you look at some of the applications that uh, you folks in the audience have just talked about, uh, the Internet of Things, uh, you know, artificial intelligence or uh, autonomous systems like the self-driving car, uh, personalized healthcare monitoring as the number of people increases and they age. Maybe uh, we want to be able to diagnose ourselves at point of uh, use. You know, maybe you want to have uh, sensors that you wear and you, so you don't have to go to the doctor or the hospital every time. Uh, you want to check your, uh, you know, your, your uh, vital signs. Maybe, maybe you want to realize on, uh, realize this on your own. So, so with, with so many people and so much traffic, these, these sort of uh, uh, applications for personalized healthcare monitoring are, are going to become much and much, uh, much more uh, common. Also, uh, robotics, uh, uh, intelligent transportation, people mentioned. So what, when you look at it, there really is going to be an astronomical uh, number of sensors that we are going to have to deal with. And that's create two, in my opinion, creates two problems. The first problem, which, which Jeff talked very nicely about, is that, you know, how do you make sense of all this sensor data? There's going to be just so much data. And that's not the limb of our expertise. And the other area is actually, do you need batteries for every one of these sensors. Because in some application, if you talk about border security, for example, or water security, you might have thousands of sensors actually spread over a large geographical area. Sometimes people this, they call this smart dust. You're not going to have time to change the battery in every one of these sensors. 
plus the lifetime of a battery, many of you have had the frustrations, is actually very limited. You know, the, their battery may last a thousand cycles, and you would like to have a sensor there and have it work for 10 years, for example. You know, a thousand cycle is just not going to do it, especially if you're going to sample a few times a day. Mm -hmm. So this goes back to Derek's question. We are also actually very heavily involved in what we call self-powered sensors. And this, uh, we have actually an initiative uh, run by the VPR's office with heavy involvement actually from John. It's trying to develop, there are, there are su different subgroups. Our subgroup is actually focused on using sweat sensing, basically looking for biomarkers in the sweat and trying to avoid having, you know, to, to, to draw your blood. So basically you can do it at home or you can do it in, in the gym. And the, uh, the, the, as a material scientist, the effect that we have at our disposal to power these things we actually have a large spectrum of things. Uh, for example, Daria works on thermoelectrics. We collaborate on this. I know that. So temperature fluctuations can give you that power. There are also materials called piezoelectrics. These are sensitive to pressure. So if you are walking or you are uh, running on a treadmill, in fact, already I saw prototypes uh, where they will put these materials on the treadmill in a gym and they will generate energy, for example, to, to light up the gym, for example. So we have also pyroelectric. Uh, we have piezoelectrics. We have a triboelectric generator. As a material scientist, there's actually a wealth of, uh, of, of phenomena that we can lean on in, in, in order to get this, uh, this, this energy. And if you look around you, uh, vibrations will play, play a role in this. Uh, solar certainly will pl uh, play a role in this. The human motion will play a role. Waves in the ocean, there are people talking about using waves in the ocean to actually use this material phenomena. And one thing, one thing else that smarters are going to have to different because their number is going to be large. I also read this morning, actually, that you know, in 2020, they're expecting they're going to need 20 billion sensors just for cars. And this is not counting uh, you know, self-driving cars. So with, the, with that number of sensors, actually, you need to make smarter sensors. They have to be multifunctional. It means a sensor is no longer enough for it to just to sense pressure, for example. It may have to do more. And it may have to be power efficient so that these, the, because all these sources we're talking about, they're actually microwatt level and, and sometimes even smaller. So I think, uh, to summarize, uh, the, the, there's going to be an astronomical, astronomical number of sensors. They're going to create two challenges. One is, is the data. How do you make sense of sensor data? And the other, how do you implement uh, you know, uh, self-powered sensors to, to tackle uh, the, the, the many things that we want to monitor? Thank you. I, I think Hussam just nailed it. I mean, that's the yeah. expertise we have up here. Expertise in terms of uh, data processing, decision making. Expertise in terms of sensor development. Expertise in terms of what I think is the most difficult challenge, um, self-powered systems, perpetual sensor. So that's the expertise you have here. I'm going to ask one more question, but I'm giving you fair warning. Be ready. You can ask about those areas, learn more about their research, but you can also ask them about urban farming and some of the other things you brought up. So in a minute, I'm reaching out to you for questions. Please be ready. Um, Jeff, maybe you can uh, explain to somebody who's not in the field how difficult it is to uh, to get the, the computers and the sensors that may be in these cities to interact with the different types of, of humans uh, in terms of you know, mm -hmm. direct control, uh, all, all the different ways that they might interact with the machines. Mm -hmm. uh, well, we can take the example of self-driving cars, uh, a term that I object to because it's not self-driven, it's a control <laughs> system uh, that's driving <laughs> that car. But I'll, I, I, okay, don't get me started. I'm already started. <laughs> 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 and uh, so there's going to be sensors on that car. Let's just stick to the part of, of, of maneuvering in, in traffic. So LIDAR and, and cameras and other types of uh, sensors. So that is to control the individual car. Now you can think about at, a, at an intersection where cars are interacting with each other. Say they're all autonomous. And we saw an amazing video this morning of, uh, say, an autonomous intersection. You can ask yourself uh, with that video of all these cars were um, moving in and out of each other uh, very uh, fluidly. Uh, what kind of decision making is going on? Is there one entity that's directing all of the cars uh, or not? Or, and if, if not, what happens if, what does one individual car know? Does it know? two, three, ten car links around it, and what does it, does it know the intention of other cars? I mean, what's the point of a turning signal if it's autonomous vehicles talking to each other? Then one can declare uh, anticipated uh, paths. So that's at the intersection level. Then it might come now at the community level where people are making decisions on commuting itself. When should I, uh, when should I go to work? What route should I take? When you have distributed decision making, uh, weird things can happen. So. I know probably uh, many of you have heard of the so-called tragedy of the commons, uh, where, where you can, a tragedy of the commons story, uh, it goes as follows, pretty much anything that says, if only everyone would fill in the blank, then we'd all be better off. 
but that fill in the blank, for example, if only everyone would stay in line, if only everyone would follow the rules, if only everyone would fill in the blank, would be better off. Uh, and then what happens, though, is when everyone else is following the rules, then as an individual, I'm incentivized to not follow the rules because <laughs> that's better off for me. So how does that manifest itself? Well, in different ways. For example, there's something well known in traffic networks and in network uh, theory in general. It's called uh, brace paradox. So with brace paradox, it's possible that adding a road, adding a road makes congestion worse. Okay? When individuals are looking out for themselves, the addition of this road can incentivize a behavior where everyone is worse off because this new road was added. And I'm not talking about more traffic. The same traffic, the same group of uh, commuters, just they reroute themselves to take advantage of the new road. Now, if only everyone would ignore that new road, we'd all be better off. But if everyone else is ignoring that new road, then I'm incentivized to take it. And when we all think in those terms, then we're all worse off. Now, you go from commuting patterns to, suppose we're dealing with uh, electric vehicles. Now, that's going to determine and have an impact on, say, when am I charging my vehicle? Uh, that's going to be influenced by when I decide to do my uh, commute. And now, what you have is the transportation network impacting the electric grid. Uh, because that's going to affect demand patterns of, of uh, when people want to charge their vehicles, how stringent or how elastic they are with uh, when my vehicle should or, or has to be uh, ready. And you see this also, the spillover. And again, with commuting and with charging, you know, we, our interests are not necessarily aligned. I don't know who here is going to say, I don't mind not charging my vehicle uh, just so for the sake of my, my neighbors. Uh, maybe I don't mind doing that, but I want to get paid. And now we have to incentivize individuals to make that. So you see this interconnectivity of different types of uh, infrastructure uh, complicated by the fact that individuals are not necessarily thinking for the team, but, but for themselves. Jeff, you just shattered my perfect crystallized vision of of everybody moving easily through this city <laughs> of the future. So. But it's good. It, it shows the research that has to happen before we can do that. So what questions do you have about these research topics? Ian, you're up first. Here, it's coming to you. You ready? <laughs> wow. Okay, okay, that's pretty good shot. <laughs> no, you, it's the microphone. Uh, a question. Oh question or a comment, and maybe you can comment on my comment panel. So the first thing I, I would say about smart cities is I don't necessarily agree that everybody actually wants one. So I think we need to do a really good job in outreach and explaining the benefits of, so for example, if somebody was to say to me, we need more sensors and we need more drones, but it's not obvious why you need that. You would think maybe it's an invasion of your personal space or privacy or, or whatever. So, I, and the, the reason I say that is I remember, actually it was my dad asked me the dreaded question, what do you do for a living? And I couldn't really think of how to explain to him what I did. At the time I was working on flexible, uh, flexible displays. And so what I said was, oh well, you know what we do is we make these big flexible displays and in the future, um, it's, everything's gonna be really smart, smart. So your phone's gonna be able to talk to this display tell this display what you like, and then this display is going to personally tell you what to buy, where it's on sale, and, and as you're walking down the street, there's going to be these displays all over the place. And he, and he just looked at me and said, that is absolutely horrendous. <laughs> so I, I'm not, I think we need to think a bit about what's actually, what the public wants in a smart city, and how we can explain to them the benefits of, for example, a flexible personalized display that's tailored to your personal needs? Because I think there will be a difference in everybody's opinion of what they would actually like to see. Fair point. I mean, any yeah. of that you guys want to address? I, I would like, yeah, to make a comment. Uh, you know, we didn't have time to discuss a lot of things, but I don't think anybody on this panel is suggesting there is no risks or that every city is going to end up looking exactly like another city. Some cities may not opt to having a zillion sensors, while others might opt to. So this is going to be dependent on the geography, uh, you know, how advanced the country is. But there are some risks for sure. For example, we uh, privacy risks, you know, so do you really want so many sensors watching you and, you know, transmitting your information wirelessly to so many people? This is number one. Uh, another risk potentially, uh, you know, uh, you know, theft. Uh, the people actually could, uh, if, you, if you have a, a medical device, maybe it's wireless, maybe people can hijack this and control, control it and hurt you. So do you want that? Uh, data theft. 
And also, if you have millions of sensors, this may be a, a big environmental impact for these things. You know, do, do you really want that? So uh, the suggestion is not that every city has to do this. The idea is that uh, when, when I thought, at least for me, from my research, uh, I see the trend. I see the number of sensors that are going in, in, in cars and, you know, that basically things are getting smarter and they need sensors to do that. So there's an exponential growth in the number of sensors, but definitely there's risks. And I just gave a few examples. Maybe my colleagues have other examples. Yeah, um, if you don't mind. Actually, my family said the same thing because we're in a similar field. We're in, mm. like when I told to my family, I was, we're doing flexible things, and they were like, "Why?" <laughs> I was like, uh, it "Would be cool," and they were like, "I don't think so." <laughs> but I think the new generation <laughs> is much more open and explorer in those things and want to use technology um, in, in their daily life. But I completely agree. These kind of energy solutions should be much more customized in the future. Uh, rather than like a global solution to everywhere. So, f uh, for example, uh, we are now working on a startup. I, I mentioned to you like on the on the transparent windows that we generate electricity for building integrated photovoltaics. So, for example, such kind of disruptive technologies um, for future, I think, is sort of unquestionable, and it's clear that it, we're in need for for uh, sort of self sustaining um, places, buildings, or cities that you can think of. Mm -hmm. um, for example, I, I mentioned to you also there are like zero carbon emission cities, for example, in the world. And I don't know anyone who would say no that I want fresher air or, or a, a greener environment or a sustainable um, city in, in, in my surroundings. So, I believe, at least for my, for my research, I'm much more motivated <laughs> than creating more sensors. And, um, but still, we create a lot of, um, how to say, a lot of things that's, that's going trash until we do that research and that comes reality as well. And I completely agree. So maybe in that respect, some more biodegradable or mm -hmm. um, conformable materials um, would play much more role in the, in the future in mm -hmm. our field. Do you want to add anything, Jeff? Uh, sure. I'll uh, also give a personal story about uh, our conversations with parents. Uh, <laughs> actually, both of my parents are math professors, so they never asked me why, because uh, I could ask them back, why are you doing what you do? Uh, so you're right in that uh, you know, a lot of the, the uh, sci-fi-ish uh, discussions of, of smart cities are about, sometimes come across as frivolous. Okay, that having, uh, being able to buy something while I'm crossing the street and have my coffee waiting for me on the other side. Uh, but, but there's nothing frivolous about, you know, the desire to have uh, clean water and sustainable agriculture. And really the technologies that we're talking about are relevant on these kinds of uh, much more pressing uh, environmental uh, matters. Uh, there's the other issue that was brought up this morning of, you know, if we have the city that has all of these uh, uh, bells and whistles, is it going to be affordable? Do we just price ourselves out of all of these uh, conveniences as well? I think the big, the big push really is, is when it comes to sustainability and environmental uh, uh, stewardship out of even, not even out of foresight, out of what's pressing and, and necessity. One more story to tell, though, about conveniences and frivolous conveniences. I think, I think we're the same generation, and there was a Steve Martin movie called L.A. Story uh, where they were mocking having a cell phone in your car because who has such an important phone call to make that they have to make it while they're in the car? And these things that are come across now as uh, uh, kind of frivolous may be things that we can't imagine doing without. Uh, but I don't need that coffee, though. <laughs> What else? Questions from the audience? Uh, yeah, just got the microphone for you. Um, so I was wondering about one thing. Um, whenever something happens, like new technology comes, there's always uh, problems and things comes before we all certain about this new technology. So I was thinking about uh, hacking the future or this whole city or something that comes across that we never thought about mm -hmm. and we can't have control, like immediate control to it. So what's going to happen to the human behavior that has been like for maybe two or three years that used to the new futuristic things? So how this uh, amount of people going to react to such crisis like this? 
Got it. Jeff, maybe you want to tackle yeah, some yeah, of that? I mean, there's yeah. always some uncertainty in rolling in a technology, mm -hmm. and then I'll, I'll talk about it from an engineering perspective, and then, and then I'll go out of my comfort zone and talk about it in a societal perspective. <laughs> so in the, my field, which is control systems, we uh, talk about something called the waterbed effect. And in the waterbed effect, uh, as similarly with a waterbed, you push down here and something pops up. When you take care of one thing, there's another issue uh, that emerges. Uh, when do we experience the waterbed effect? Uh, when you're trying to get more and more performance out of a system, for example, if we're riding our bicycle really fast, that's good performance. And what is, happens though, then we become sensitive to disturbances in the road. So if we hit a little bump while we're riding fast, we may fall over. Whereas if we're riding slow, then there can be lots of gravel in the road and we don't, we don't uh, fall. And I think that you'll find this kind of a waterbed effect manifests itself in, uh, at a societal level. And when we introduce one thing, it's like we're almost as we're bringing in, you might even view it as an invasive species in an ecosystem. And what is going to be the long-term uh, impact? And that's where sensors and then uh, systems modeling can try to address these, uh, these issues of saying, if, if an, I had better data, then presumably I can make better models and then try to then do conceptual studies of, of what if testing uh, to try to uh, gather uh, what would happen. But again, now we're dealing with how human behavior will change. And there you really, it's human behavior is not like uh, physics. There's no, not necessarily first principles, although there's an evolving, you know, uh, uh, you know there is a, a standing, long-standing science, but you can't do repeatable controlled experiments uh, that you can, the same that you can in an engineered uh, setting. So it will require uh, some uh, bit of modeling and some bit of testing and, and uh, a leap of faith. There's your soundbite for you. Jeff just referred to autonomous vehicles as the next invasive species. <laughs> what other questions from the audience? Take them outside of their comfort zone. Yeah, Usman? Hi, very good talk. Uh, simple question. If you have so many sensors, what about the disturbance, interference? Usually, like, so you're not allowed to make a call on the, in the plane using a mobile? You're not allowed to, when you're in the hospital, you're not allowed to use a mobile because of interference will affect the instrumentation. So having millions of sensors, how would you gonna deal with the disturbance or interference? Thanks. I think it's also for Jeff. Yeah. Go ahead. I think, I think yeah. as, uh, you're talking about at a technological level of uh, shielding and interference, that is, that is an issue. It's just, it's just there. And uh, I don't have more to say about that. Uh, you know, the more, more we can do, the more we can interfere with others. Yeah. Bandwidth? Mm -hmm. Is, I mean, is even the bandwidth feasible? You know, there are and go ongoing at KAUST uh, research to try to look at alternative modes of communication. For example, there's, uh, there are efforts in electrical engineering that's looking at uh, uh, light as a, uh, a free space uh, optics to look to for, uh, for communications. Uh, so from building to building, one can use lasers to communicate at very high uh, bandwidth. Uh, there are also... In, uh, uh, Professor Slim Alwini and, and Buen Oi working on underwater communications using light. So there may be different modalities to try to curb that effect. Uh, but if I want to go back to the, the, uh, the Braze paradox, you know, more is not necessarily better, as is kind of what you're saying as, as well. And adding sensors, adding communications, adding all of this infrastructure can have a downside. Either an in, the immediate downside is in the terms of interference. There's maybe an indirect downside into we made connections where we didn't anticipate them before. I was trying to think of an example before the, the Sci Cafe of, uh, you know, if we, if we think about smart city in terms of these, wouldn't it be nice if... Okay, so in, in buildings in general, you have coupling between uh, the climate control from one zone to another, and in large buildings, uh, it's, it's particularly important to, to try to have some level of coordination of, say, when we're trying to mod uh, affect the temperature in, in common zones, okay, and to try to schedule that, uh, that uh, allocation of, of, of resource. Now, where's the wouldn't it be nice if? Wouldn't it be nice if our, uh, you know, our temperature regulation is connected? And wouldn't it be nice if, as I'm coming to work for the sake of saving energy, uh, we have some smart sensors recognize that I'm coming home, rather, and now is getting my climate of my apartment ready for my arrival home. Well, what's just happened is that my smartwatch is 
impact is impacting your thermostat. And so you can, as you introduce these more and more connectivity, you are also introducing more and uh, potential uh, vulnerabilities, cascading failures, uh, fragilities that need not have been anticipated. Mm -hmm. And interference is just the immediate one. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you can take this also one step further. Now, you know, when we have a power outage, you know, it, maybe it's localized, but imagine if everything is online communicating together and you do have a uh, Wi-Fi outage, God forbid, what happens to... So this is another one I was thinking about. This actually could be catastrophic, you know, in a sense, yeah. Especially if you're relying on medic dispensing medical care or over wireless sensors like that. Any, Any other questions out maybe? there? Yeah. We have a question from someone on Facebook Live, Alex Victoria. She asks, how do we ensure that those with the least economic resources can easily navigate our cities of the future? It sounds like the new cities of the future could leave the most vulnerable, vulnerable of us behind. All right, everybody's got to get outside their comfort zone. Well, I mean, there's no doubt that new technology, when it first starts, is always expensive. And, you know, so uh, when I was a student, I could not afford, that. you know, many things that came on, on the market because at the beginning they were expensive. But the volume, I worked in the semiconductor industry for a long time for about 10 years, and when you first start a, a new technology, for example, initially the chip is so expensive, it can only go in the, in the top notch, your most expensive devices, but over time, the volume, the economy of scale kicks in, and things become cheaper. So I think we will not be able to avoid uh, this uh, initial uh, you know, high cost, because the development of things uh, is expensive, and maybe in the beginning things won't be accessible to uh, a large slice of the society, but as things, economies of scale kicks in and you make more and more of these devices, the price, you know, everything has shown that it goes down and then it becomes accessible. Things about GPS, at one point this was strictly for the military, it, 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 uh, it got, uh, you know, per, you know uh, uh, more common, more mature, it really trickled down and now everybody has it on, on their phone, so that, that's, that's bound to happen. True. Um, I, may, I may comment also, actually I can take this comment through energy because um, we really work for the zero emission or the energy cities which is required but as Hussam mentioned all these technologies will be quite expensive in the beginning as we have seen already the examples around the world but I believe sometimes things should be consciously done for the sustainability or energy, and uh, sorry, the energy efficiency rather than just the cost. So for example, the, the phones, the smartphones we're using are all very expensive. I find almost as, as expensive as a laptop or a computer, but everybody has that for the functionality for now or conveniency. So um, we just need um, to make people more conscious about the environment and the energy efficiency. And in that case, I believe these products or technologies can be more, um, in day use, and then if the cost would be issued, that, that can be solved in the, f in the future, I believe. Yeah, it's not going to be just an a, a economical argument. It's, it's going to be a policy argument policy, as well. Policy, yeah, definitely. Yeah. I'll, I'll add a comment, though. I think that the, the, uh, the, this question or comment from Facebook is spot on, and that, you know, are we going to price people out? Of, uh, of smart cities with all of, the, all of its promises and what kind of economic policies or, or mobility and access policies uh, can be put in place to make sure that that a place is uh, democratic and, and not exclusive and, and, and diverse. Uh, it's, a, it's a very tough question, but I think that that's a real uh, risk. Now, on the uh, other side, uh, you know, this, the technologies that we're talking about actually have enabled uh, certain segments of society to to have access where there wasn't access before. Uh, you can think that with, uh, say, our wireless connectivity now, then we can bring a certain infrastructure uh, that's at, on the cheap that were, couldn't have been brought uh, otherwise. And so there is a big uh, upside uh, to the the work that's happening uh, as well. But I think that you know the intent of the question was was uh, you know, to, for these uh, communities to be exclusive, and uh, that's a real concern. Other questions from the audience? Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, Michael, toss him that. Thank you. Uh, my question, which is generic, is so moving towards uh, the smart cities and, and data and the communication. As, as a layman, how, how, how sure am I in this, uh, is that data being, the information being shared? Like one example is the recent, the Facebook, information uh, being shared. 
So a as a common man, how would I ensure that my data is, is protected? I am not sure you can as a common man, <laughs> to be honest with you, because uh, there's different localities have different rules of regulations. And uh, there has been many instances where, uh, you know, governments in different parts of the world or uh, localities, they, they, they demand access to this data. This is number one. And number two, there was a talk about a question about hacking er earlier on. So see, either through policy, your data may be, ha may be accessible or through malicious intent uh, or, or hacking. And if, if you think hacking is bad today, wait till we have a, a really, really, uh, you know, uh, Internet of Things uh, dominating our cities. It's going to be very difficult to do this, and it's going to take time to learn how to do it. But in the meantime, I'm not sure anybody should assume that their uh, data is fail safe or 100% or, or, or secure. Mm -hmm. One of my uh, students, uh, Georgia Tech, where I was before I came here, is, works in cybersecurity. And I asked him, what can I do to make my computer safe? He said, don't bother. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> safe from him, even. Uh, that's, uh, <laughs> and and so, hey, one thing, it's, and this is not at all comforting, but it is true that our, our notion of what constitutes privacy is evolving. Uh, and it's not the same now that it was before. But, but now that's uh, the kind of t attacks that you're talking about can be n catastrophic uh, if, if, uh, if sufficiently uh, malicious. So it's, it's a, it is an issue. There is ongoing arms race, if you will, of, of uh, cryptography and, and cybersecurity. And, and that arms race is going to, uh, to continue. But that situation is there. And, and one more thing, I'll, uh, I, I don't intend to get political, but I did just come out of a, the U.S. did just come out of a political election where <laughs> these kinds of issues are, uh, are also at the forefront of discussion. Just to switch gears for a second, I mean, the, the audience is clearly interested in the communication and the technology elements, but the, the power side of this, I mean, it, it, is a, it is a goal we'd all like to reach in terms of a zero emission city. I mean, is that feasible? What, what, what type of things do we need to do? I mean... It, um, I, I don't think everybody realizes how challenging that's going to be. Maybe you can comment with some of the work that well, you're doing. I think maybe Daria should start because you are working on zero emission city. I, I have my opinion. I think that's be diffic difficult to do practically. Yeah. Uh, but we certainly could make a, you know, a headway. I mean, there is it, any city would probably have to have a multifaceted strategy for how we uh, you know, uh, balance uh, sustainable sources of energy and, and maybe not uh, so sustainable because... Uh, you know, it is very challenging to, uh, at least in the immediate future, to run 100% on sustainable sources for everything, for every, for every sensor, for every bit of instrument. But, uh, uh, you know, as a long-term goal, this is certainly a noble goal we should also work for. But uh, there's many challenges to do that for every kind of application, you know, because even, uh, you know, electric uh, cars or, or, or things that run on battery, but these are also create other challenges in terms of... Uh, recycling, in terms of contamination, in terms of effect on water resources. Uh, so you, you could have uh, cars running with, you know, without gasoline, but, but then they may create another problem. It's like the waterbed effect you, you are talking about. So uh, my personal opinion is that uh, having 100%, it, it, it may not be feasible, but we could get, make, a, make a big headway, you know, mm -hmm. in, in that sense. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I specifically don't work on that, but, yeah. but I dream on that, let's say because uh, I, I wish it could happen, but with the current technology or the um, energy resources, let's say, it's not mm. maybe possible. But, and, uh, and there have been efforts around the world. Uh, I was just looking in China and Master City, even in Ireland, actually, a couple of little places, uh, trying to do it zero emission. Yeah. And uh, maybe like you mentioned, Usam, it's not going to be only uh, yeah. renewables, but it's a mix of that. I feel so. when I, I find ourselves a bit pessimistic now, you know, and so <laughs> skeptical. I think we should, I think, look forward and think a little bit. It can be and it will be and really put all of our efforts, as I mentioned, like consciously move towards that rather than thinking, oh, what it might happen. So in that respect, I, I think it is possible. But where and how is a, is a question. Maybe mm -hmm. not everywhere, like we mentioned. Um, but we need to think about natural resources of every place. And maybe it will be more customized rather than one single solution that this is the, this is the answer. For example, I, we were thinking, but I have no idea how to minimize the carbon emission of the planes or like the air mm -hmm. traffic and this and that. But we need to, I believe we need to start from somewhere. And um, all our efforts, especially in counts, is towards that direction, which makes me very happy and believe in that as well all these years. Good. And um, I, I spend all my 
efforts of, with my research group and my career, let's say, on, on this too. Yeah. What else from the audience do you want to know? Um, I'm curious, uh, with the city of the future, you have all these different systems interplaying, and that would imply some degree of either standardization or cross-communication between the systems. Um, you know, you've got a sensor coming from China, another one coming from the U.S., another one coming from here. How do you get all these systems to play together from a control system standpoint, from a, you know, the data coming out in some sort of standard way of thinking? Um, yeah. You know, even to energy, I, you know, I have an appliance from the U.S., I can't plug it in here, I have another one from somewhere else. <laughs> How do we integrate all these things Get my together? solar converter. Yeah, I mean, th this is an excellent question. Uh, from a device point of view, and uh, Jeff can comment on the communications, I mean, uh, if, if you are going to buy a, a set of sensors, you can specify how you want them to run. You know, for example, you know, even though the, the, the power in Europe may, may be different from, from the U.S., if you wanted to buy a washing machine, you could spec, you know, that I will buy it when it has this, it can, this, this current, this power, uh, like that. So, so usually for, for, for self-powered sensors, for example, we know uh, exactly uh, what we need to run this sensor, uh, how much uh, microwatt hour you know, per centimeter cube or power density. Uh, we know what sort of frequency it has to work in. So we, we can make these specifications. And whether it's made in China or made Europe, if the manufacturer has met these specifications, uh, it, it should work. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, the, you know, uh, this, is, this is how it will be done. Now, the standardization of how uh, you know, a sensor powered by thermal fluctuation uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, what temperature range or what power was the lifetime, I think this also has to depend on the locality. You know, for example, you know, some localities, military, for example, specs things at higher temperature than civilian applications. So this is going to have to be dictated by the, the user, the end user, basically. Hmm. Uh, there is work in uh, the area of complexity theory to address this. And, uh, you know, if you look up the terms of uh, hourglasses and bow ties, this is what comes up. So when you think about standards, uh, so I'll explain that when you think about standards, it, it's, a, it's kind of a constraint that things have to conform. But it turns out that, that when there's a constraint on how things uh, can interact, then it actually enables diversity in other ways. So for example, uh, take, take the internet, lots of devices can engage uh, the internet, lots of applications can uh, exploit uh, these devices, but then there's a, I, that, and that's the, uh, the bow tie of, of the different devices, the different applications, but all of them going through standardized <laughs> internet protocol. And so although we think of this as a limiting case, it actually that limitation enables the diversity and the different ways uh, different uh, things can interact with each other. There's a question over there. Yep. Um, I would like to bring this back to the environment, uh, you know, aspect of things. Um, it's interesting that we're talking about zero carbon dioxide emission, and I think that we're back to the, you know, waterbed um, problem. Um, we're generating a new kind of waste, which is technological waste. I personally have, like, three iPads that are not usable anymore, and uh, apparently they cannot... Uh, uh, be reused or um, uh, it's, it's just sitting there. And I, I imagine that multiplying it by billions around the world, uh, that is actually generating more problem than what, is, what we're currently facing with uh, carbon dioxide uh, emissions. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Well, this is an extremely important point, uh, I think. And then so there's, again, a different ways to deal with this. Number one, I lament the fact that actually there's not in, in many universities around the world, actually, there's not a lot of emphasis on recycling science. I mean, there's actually, this is, should be an extremely important discipline. And part of the reason is that we are just digging more mines. There's a lot of raw materials still to, to support what we need. But ultimately, uh, we're going to get to a point where uh, we're going to have to do something about it. So this is something I think policymakers have a responsibility. Us, have a, uh, you know, as a technical university, have a responsibility. There has to be more uh, on recycling science. There is a lot of trash, and maybe some of you heard in the Somewhere in the, in the actually Pacific Ocean, there is like a Texas-sized pile of trash actually floating, which is kind of really sad. So there has to be a, a lot of emphasis on, on recycling science and, and maybe some subsidies from the government to encourage this like they did with solar. And you see solar is really becoming a success story because of all these subsidies. At the same time, we should attack this also from another angle. 
And I, uh, like Darius said earlier, actually, we should try to make uh, our sensor from biodegradable material, if possible. And that's something we actually are trying to do. So uh, go on, these are just two ideas I can think of right now. Uh, really pushing recycling science, subsidizing it, encouraging it, because ultimately we have to do this. And then, for example, you know, uh, also this, uh, you know, the, 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 the variation in plastic bottles. This really is one of the worst things that has happened to us in a very long time. And if we can work on reinforced paper to replace all these and, and actually set in laws in motion that would prevent using plastic bottles, I think this would go a very, uh, very long way, making them biodegradable, require that they are biodegradable. So going from that angle, us making the sensors from biodegradable material, environmentally friendly material, uh, are two ideas or two examples I can think of to, to help alleviate the question that you raised. Yeah. For those of you that don't work in the, the sensors field, the material science, the semiconductor field, um, Biodegradable, biocompatible, <laughs> all those bio words don't necessarily uh, jive with high performance. So there's a lot of interesting research happening in that field. So. Well, if you don't mind, I can add up on that. Actually, uh, thanks for this comment. Yeah. And uh, I know Hussam is coming from semiconductor industry, which is all inorganic <laughs> materials. And in, in Solar Center, we, we work with organic materials from some of them from nature, some of them actually um, let's say, created and designed. And with that, we, we are now able to actually some parts of the solar cell. If you look in YouTube, you can find that people make solar cells from fruits, from red fruits that you can, you can generate electricity, which is amazing, actually. And uh, if you want to move to biodegradable or biocompatible, it's much more um, closer technology, I should say. People use paper or cellulose or n uh, natural products as substrates and that you can foil with and still make them functional and transparent or flexible, which is actually a, a way to go, I completely agree. And I, I completely forgot, but we have some um, prototypes. If you're, if you're interested, you can have a look. So you can also, one good thing compared to the um, common inorganic semiconductor industry is that you don't need the vacuum processes with these materials that you can apply printing and coating techniques. Um, which hopefully will be much more environmentally friendly in the in the future. Yeah, so what's coming around is a solar-powered reading lamp made from some of these printed technologies and a few other examples yeah. if you mm -hmm. want to take a look. That's a, that's a printed one. Um, yeah. one PhD. Maybe time for one more question. One more question. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Yeah, hi. I, I believe in the future, everyone need to be or want to work as mobile. They don't want to be uh, in a specific place, so they need also power. So do you think it's visible to have uh, wireless charging? Uh, also, you mentioned the issue with the sensors. Mm -hmm. They want to be powered. Yes. Can we char charge them wirelessly? Mm -hmm. And if this visible, is this going to affect also the, the health of the human uh, to have electricity yeah. everywhere? Thank you. Correct. Yeah, I mean, uh, certainly one of the modes uh, of energy, we call this energy harvesting. So under the, uh, the, this title, there are many technologies that are people uh, looking at, you know, and, and, and each based on uh, their skill set and, and then experiences. So RF, you know, there's a lot of RF signals uh, that are flying around from our phones. Uh, uh, you know, in, in uh, you know, megahertz regime, and there's a lot of people trying to actually use an antenna and get that uh, energy, and then actually store it, and then power devices. You can get, if I'm correct, a few watts actually that way, uh, and then so that is a, that is feasible, and some people are doing that. But the, 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 for, for wearable sensor and small sensors, actually, this is kind of a viable solution. You can do that. Another viable solution, uh, which we are working on, actually, in our project. It turns out through the triboelectric effect or the piezoelectric effect. Uh, the piezoelectric effect is one of the, the, the highest energy density after solar, actually. Basically, from walking, uh, if you have something in your shoes, for example, it is in principle you can actually uh, charge your sensor. Or if you put something on, on your arm here, and you, you can actually generate. Because remember, these sensors, the mode of operation, it's not like necessarily like a battery, like you have to have them on all the time. Our model in our project, at least, you will have a a wearable medical patch that can actually sample uh, your sweat. And we have made it. It is working, actually, here at Kaust. And the way we power this is just from walking. The idea is that this sensor will be on your hand or on your body, uh, and then it will wake up a few times a day, sample a measurement, and then maybe send it wirelessly to your phone. So the amount of power you need 
is actually not like all day long. So you, you basically from walking can store in a capacitor and energy and this will stay there. Then the, you know, every interval you program the sensor, it wakes up, it uses that energy from the capacitor, does a measurement, transmits it wirelessly. Today this is happening. I am not sure we have the most efficient systems. And in a way, you know, um, although they are powered by batteries, the wearable uh, watches you see right now from different suppliers actually uh, go along these lines. This is just uh, now, uh, in, in the past, if you look at the medical sensors and medical patches, uh, the sensing has typically been done for like temperature, you know, respiration. Uh, now the, the field actually is moving into ele basically electrochemical, physiological interaction with the body. So getting liquids or, you know, sweats or maybe saliva or maybe, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, tears, even the Google, the Google lens actually falls in this category. It tries to physiologically interact with the body, not just from a temperature and, and stress or pressure point of view, but more in a, from a chemical point of view. And the amount of uh, power you need for these actually is not that large. I can say that uh, for sure the piezoelectric can drive these sensors, RF can drive some these sensors, but these systems maybe are not optimized enough to, to be deployed commercially yet, but, but they work. I think that's a positive way to end. Um, again, I think some of the technology that CAST is working on uh, is very close to becoming a part of cities now and cities of the future. Uh, I think this is an interdisciplinary topic that really fits KAUST. I think you saw some of that today. I know there's other professors in the audience that are, that are looking at urban farming, that are looking at, um, at some of the other elements that are going to exist in the cities of the future. So um, thank you for your questions. Thank you for your interest. And please join us uh, at the next Sci Cafe.